is a professor in animal science, uh, animal and range sciences at the Department of uh, the Animal and Range. Let me just start this all over again. Uh, he's a, he is a professor in the Animal and Range Science Department at Montana State University. He holds a bachelor's of science in range science from the University of Wyoming, a master's in forest and range science from Washington State, and then he returned to Wyoming for his PhD. He began his professional career as a research associate in the plant sciences department of the University of Wyoming, where he developed an environmental impact and monitoring protocol for coal fire uh, power plant in Gillette. He went on to take a position as a forester in forestry, fisheries, and wildlife department with the PVA um, in Casper, Wyoming, and became responsible for the rehabilitation of uranium, uh, uranium, uranium exploration, mining, and milling sites. In 1990, uh, Dr. Marlowe joined, uh, moved to Montana, joined MSU in the College of Agriculture and the Montana Agriculture Experiment Station. He then served as the Associate Dean for a 10-year period between 1989 and 1999, and he currently divides his time between two departments, um, looking at, uh, in between teaching and research, looking at areas of riparian ecology, uh, wildland, fire ecology, livestock, habitat improvement. And so from there, I will turn it over. Uh, one of the things I'm particularly excited about is getting um, the riparian, uh, getting a talk on riparian processes and inclusion of soil. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And John, we are, we got it up and running. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I really appreciate everyone being here. Uh, I, I told several of the people I've worked with firsthand a number of times, Gary and Bob, that any of the hard questions go to them. Okay, But I'm, I'm going to invite you at any time, say stop, time out, what do you mean? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit with my observations or my own experience because <clears throat> this is a growing field. I, I teach, well, in fact, right now I'm teaching a riparian ecology class, and I always tell my students there was no such thing as a riparian before 1978. Unless you were in law, you, you didn't know what a riparian was, or those of you who are chronologically gifted like me and remember uh, the Olympia beer and its artesians, you know, the riparian was the uncle to the artesians. So we're still continuing to grow. We're still trying to figure out how, which direction do I punch this? Ah, there. So I, I thought though what we'd better start out with is a few of the basic buzzwords that everybody uses right now. Sustainability, condition, stability. Um, and that drives a lot of the policy which in turn drives the way we try to manage riparian areas. And uh, I think, and I'm going to try to submit to you as we go through, that much of this is actually based on our attitudes. And stability is my favorite example of it. Uh, and stability has to be applied to riparian processes in a much different concept then I think the general public would really feel comfortable with. Again, don't try to read through all of this. What I've done is I've gone in and put in highlights that we want to come back to. Uh, for example, the general definition of sustainability rests on the capacity of that area, that biosphere, to produce needs, services, for the present and future generations. Uh, that's just a sexy term. A long time ago when I first learned it, that word was conservation. But still the same thing, the capacity to meet needs. And what I want to emphasize as I talk about this is the measures then of sustainability are actually the products we want. Either a marketable product or a service. So we define what sustainability is. Uh, and in particular, we're going to define it in a way that it rolls out through uh, 
several generations. Stability, we're going to come back to this. It's, we have time in it, structure and function of a healthy system. Structure and func function, I'm going to submit to you, are what really define or bracket capacity. If we talk about having a sustainable system, we have to look at the structure and function of that system in order to realize its capacity, in order to protect its capacity. And those of you like Bob Leinard that have worked with me for a number of years in riparian areas, uh, process and function, properly functioning, key words. The last one I want to talk about is ecological condition. It's those physical, chemical, and biological characteristics that define this biosphere that has the capacity to be stable, to provide the goods and services we wanted. But I put another word in there, state. And I, I think it's important as we talk about it today that most of the measures we make of an ecosystem are really just a point in time. And then we're trying to draw inferences from that point in time. And riparian areas really give us a challenge to try to use a point in time. So to roll them all together, sustainability, stability, and condition, foundational to what we're talking about, this is about the best map I could come up with. And I should have got a hold of somebody over here because what I'm trying to show right here is the Pliocene or pre-Pleistocene drainage of the Yellowstone and Missouri rivers. And this always just messes my students' minds up terrible when I tell them that all of these big rivers in Montana, uh, except the Clark Fork, actually drained into the Hudson Bay, not into the Atlantic. And so I tell them, so what riparian condition, what stability measure do we want to use? This one, when the rivers all flowed north into the Hudson Bay, or the more recent one, that now the rivers are still resetting themselves into a new drainage. And that really starts giving us a challenge with our time estimate over what period of time do we want to talk about this? What period of time do we expect to see these goods and services portrayed? Uh, this is an endpoint. How many of you have ever been in a circumstance where you've heard before Europeans were here, before European contact, all of this happened? That's a standard for determining ecological condition. The point I'm going to try to make today is that that might be too narrow in time for us to, to really take advantage of. So sustainability of riparian areas. Uh, and I, I'm going to break our riparian areas into two subsets of the LOTIC system. And I guess I should point out real quick, riparian covers two types of wetland environments. One of them, the lentic, which is the true bog, swamp, fen, and then the lotic, which is the stream and river. Most of my experience has, has been with the lotic systems. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. This is the Powder River. Uh, too thick to drink, too thin to plow, okay? It's a surface-fed system coming out of the Bighorns uh, of Wyoming, uh, draining into Montana. Uh, surface, the surface-fed systems like the Powder, the Missouri, the Jefferson, the Big Hole, were a, a big concern uh, in the early 80s and 90s over we have to get them back in a sustainable condition. Livestock grazing, mining, logging has tanked these systems. We, we've got to recover them. And so we, the federal government came up with uh, a concept called proper functioning condition. 
and it was meant to enhance these systems stability, help them recover, help us to continue to receive the goods and services. But the other thing that we have to keep in mind with these surface fed systems is what makes them function properly. And if you don't get anything else out of what I talk about today, is they have to flood. And when we rob these loading systems of flooding, and not only flooding, but the opportunity for the flood to come up out of the channel onto the floodplain, we've robbed it of its sustainability. Spring-fed systems, on the other hand, that isn't an issue, okay? Spring-fed systems instead are going to be more closely attuned to the surface conditions and the geologic formations where they arise. Uh, the French, I'm stealing a term from the French riparian people back in the mid 80s, they called properly functioning riparian areas, they were said to be in dynamic equilibrium. Isn't that a nice, obtuse term? What does dynamic equilibrium mean? That's not a rhetorical question. What does dynamic equilibrium mean in your mind? That it changes a lot, but it basically changes around some stable, sort of average situate condition parameters. I mean, it's, not, it's not constant. There we go. It's not constant, and, and I appreciate that. See, it's safe to ask me questions and make comments. I didn't go, Wah! wrong, okay? But that's exactly right. I, there are these great fluctuations in these systems, but those fluctuations seem to stay within a certain set of bounds, that then they deflect back into a new pattern. And certainly these riparian systems are that way. For example, this great big sandbar, okay? Some would look at that and say, oh my gosh, we've got to stop the logging, we've got to stop the grazing. Uh, look at all the sediments being dumped into this river. And I look at it and say, no, this is part of the dynamic equilibrium. It's building a new floodplain, a new nursery bar for cottonwoods and willows. Because if you look at the old flight, floodplain in the background it's already past its prime as a riparian area now moving into upland that's part of that equilibrium back and forth uh, we can talk about spring fed systems but I'm, I'm going to stay again more with the Lodic this is the Jefferson River across the hill from us uh, you look at that photograph bad should we track the landowners down, cut all their fingers off for causing that to happen to a stream system? I'll move for you. Sorry. Is that bad? Good fishing hole there. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I would submit to you this large woody debris, as Bob pointed out, there's a good fishing hole right there. We need that material in that channel because that creates some of the habitat features for our microinvertebrates and our fish. Uh, it also supplies uh, some barrier to keep that bank from eroding away. And most importantly, what you notice with that big root wad is it's creating now uh, a point for that sediment to build up against. And so we have a new bar being formed. In the late 60s, early 70s, uh, in the coastal ranges of Oregon and Washington, people looked at that after they went through with all the clear cut, cut logging and all the logging debris was in the channels and they said my gosh the only way we're going to save the salmon and the steelhead is to pull that all out so a lot of my colleagues uh, got summer jobs they were more ambitious than me working for the forest service pulling that material out of the streams and rivers and guess what they found out by the early 1980s they'd screwed up their fish habitat by removing it. So then my students got hired by the Forest Service to go out and put the logs back in. But 
Flooding is the driving force, and, and we really have to look at it, particularly now in the face of climate change, very closely. The timing of the runoff. When are the stage, peak stages coming out? That's important. Of course, the volume, that's what everybody talks about, but so too is the duration of how long that flood lasts. Why? Why would you suppose how long that flood lasts is important to a riparian system? It's real mechanical. The bigger the flood, the longer the flood, the more gravel and cobble that's deposited. Short floods with very low stages only deposit silt and clay. So if we want these gravels and cobbles that become the reds for our trout species, we need a big flood of long duration. Groundwater recharge, the phreatic and hyperreic uh, recharge patterns that we're going to talk about are going to become very, very important, folks. Because all of the climate change models indicate that starting roughly in September, but certainly geared up by October and into February, many of our small streams have the potential of going dry. Why? No recharge. No recharge. I, until I really started getting into this, I never appreciated snow. Uh, and I, my wife beats me for saying that, but I really appreciate snow because it's the ultimate recharge. It goes away very, very slowly and allows that water into the ground. If we lose that recharge capacity, we're going to have streams that are no longer perennial. Uh, Luna Leopold pointed out in the late 70s, early 80s, that you can go through the entire continental United States, measure the cross sections of streams and rivers, and effectively pre predict the size of the basin that that stream is draining. Because those streams, from the little first order stream clear up to the Missouri River, if it isn't dammed, adapt a cross section that will transport the two year flood event. And the two year flood event is the most common flood event. And that's the size of the channel so it can convey that. Uh, if we start putting less water into that system, it will begin to, the channel will adapt itself to a smaller cross section. Then what happens when it floods? When we get the historic 100 year flood? Then we get major losses. Uh, we need good condition in the uplands to keep that continuous recharge pattern going through to keep our little spring cricks going. We change the vegetation, the soil complex in the watershed, we change the springs. With the wildfire work I'm, I'm working in right now, time and time again, I'll, I'll run into a rancher that said, you know, this wildfire took a lot of my feed, but I've got springs now that my granddad talked about. And now all of a sudden they're running water. We'll talk about why that is. So, here's ecology with all of our linkages and our interactions that interconnect what's going on in this upland with that riparian system. We have the effects of grazing, how it alters the structure and the composition of the plant community. Fire, it certainly alters that. Drought changes that plant community, the soil dynamic. As those change, we get different sediment uh, signals coming into the stream. Jean Chamber and her group in Nevada use a term they hill slope reservoir. And what they talk about is the combination of drought and grazing produces a lot of sediment that's just hanging up in the watershed. It's hanging up behind rocks and logs and small depressions 
small coolies. We finally get a big snow year or a big thunder storm move in and all of that reserve sediment is released <coughs> in one big episode into the stream system. All of this in turn affects infiltration both in the upland and in the floodplain. Fire, grazing affects infiltration. Infiltration is important for what? Our, our groundwater recharge. Okay. Uh, so grazing, fire, and drought really, folks, in my experience, are if if we look at the focal point, it's infiltration. What is that doing to the soil's ability to capture and pull in moisture? Uh, and anything that we do that changes that ultimately changes the riparian area. Because here are the linkages. The sediment loading going into the riparian area and the groundwater inflow that maintains that late season uh, flow. <coughs> Ecological condition. Uh, Bob Leinard taught me well. Ecological condition are the soil processes and the plant community. Certainly we can go out, we can measure nutrient cycling, we can measure organic matter turnover, all part of the soil processes, but it's expensive and time consuming and only dull boring people like Clayton Marlowe like to measure it. Instead, if you really want to get work done over a large area, you look at the plant community and the composition of the plant community. So we know that grazing affects that structure, both in positive and negative ways. Uh, drought has a tremendous impact. In fact, some of the work being done worldwide right now indicates that drought's the big driver. Grazing is kind of periphery. But drought, again, how long the drought is, the, you know, the, how it affects the seasonality of the precipitation, I cheated, you know, most of you have good enough experience, you know that that uh, tree kill, that lodgepole kill in that creek is probably really not due to drought, it's due to pine beetles. But a tremendous body of information that says when we get too many trees on a landscape, they compete with each other and they start experiencing stress. Then when we bring in even a moderate amount of drought, the stress load is so great, the trees are weakened and now the insects can attack them. The bark beetle is not an invasive species. It's been here at least since the Pleistocene. What's happening though is the way we've managed the landscape has made our forest far more vulnerable to bark beetles and ultimately, whether we realize it or not, we're having an impact. Everybody looks at these bison grazing along this creek and say, oh, they're gonna get in and walk on the creek. I wanna leave you today with the fact what they're doing clear up here in these uplands will have as great an impact as down here. It'll just take longer to see it. Some old, old data but very well done. Just give you an idea of those bison in the upper watershed and ecological condition. Here, ecological condition is just described as nothing more than plant cover. 60 to 75 percent of the ground is covered by some form of vegetation. What they considered fair, only 30 percent, and then poor, only 10 percent. What I've tried to represent here is, in this dotted red line, is surface runoff. So when we have 60 to 75 percent of the ground covered in that upland, we get very little sediment delivery. In fact, we only lose about 2 percent of the rainfall event. Why? Because it goes in the ground. But we have too many bison, too many cattle, too many developments, the wrong type of logging, we lose ground cover. Now we're losing 14% of our effective rainfall. 
Uh, say what you will about Alan Savory, but I always remember one of his comments, improperly managed livestock create droughts. And the reason they do is this right here. We're losing our effective precipitation. We get more sediment being delivered off the site. And finally down here in poor condition, we've lost 73% of our rainfall event, our precipitation event. Tremendous volume of sediment coming off the site. What do you mean lost to where? Okay, good. It, it runs down the creek, takes all that sediment with it, and on down valley. It leaves the watershed. Thank also you for asking. Yeah, yeah, this is surface runoff. Thank you very much for bringing that up. It's, it's leaving as surface runoff rather than going in as infiltration. <clears throat> because here, <clears throat> because the vegetation is capturing and holding it, it's going in the ground. Here there's nothing to capture and hold it, so it's leaving. Somebody downriver from us is getting the benefit of the water and the sediment. The yes, sir. Might be important to point out here that not every ecological or range of sediments would have capacity for 75% cover. Get on the soil, 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 and so forth. 50 might be the best you could ever expect in that particular location. Uh, uh, excellent point. Thank you, Bob, for bringing it up. In, in fact, when we get up in the Missouri River breaks, if you can get 10% on some of those sites, you're, you're lucky. So I am overgeneralizing, so thank you for bringing that up. But in a minute, I'm going to come back and tell you, talk about being confusing and hypocritical, I'm going to tell you that this isn't so bad in some cases for our riparian processes. That that sediment reaching the channel isn't such a bad thing. Here is just what Bob was talking about. This is... Uh, Sorry for the quality of it, I stole it from the photographer. Uh, this is a landslide, a naturally occurring landslide coming into the Snake River between Jackson, Wyoming and Alpine, Wyoming about nine years ago. And you can see the vehicles there so you know how big that slide is. Went right into the river. Bad, terrible, awful, right? No. No, because this is a source of sediment now that will go downriver to build new sandbars and new gravel bars to grow new aspen, or not aspen, cottonwoods and new willows, okay? So these systems need a dose of sediment to function properly. In fact, one of our biggest problems with our dams in the United States is we rob the river of its sediment load that it needs. And I've heard hydrologists and engineers say, Clean water is hungry water. The physics of moving water requires it to pick up a load of sediment to do what? To slow it down. To decrease its erosive nature. And if we don't have sediment delivery, then we have uh, an unhealthy, a non-functioning system. In the United States, I would submit to you, this is one of the unrecognized agents that really plays a role in proper riparian function. And I know that sounds really bizarre, but I'm gonna to try to give you an argument that fire and the removal of fire from our systems has probably caused more damage than any Angus cow. Just short term, for this immediate area, uh, very, very good forestry work indicates at European contact, the fire regime in these ponderosa, pine, inland Douglas fir forests, just like right here at Butte, we had a fire somewhere in this basin about every 10 to 25 years. Uh, and we probably suffered less than 20% mortality of the big trees. So what were those fires doing? They were taking out the little trees and the shrubs. And keep that in mind, we'll come back to it. Uh, if we get over in the Anaconda area, get closer to Butte, we see a little, or Butte, Missoula, I'm going the wrong way, we see a little different interval come about 
Now we're seeing fires about every 25 to 40 years, but still we're only getting about 30% mortality of our big trees. So these are kind of cleaning fires. They're just going through, they're cleaning up the understory, they're taking the smaller trees out, and we would say, well, why is that important? Why are all those little trees important? Uh, here's some old Forest Service work. We had to go into their files and dig it out. But they did a survey in the Seeley Lake uh, area back right at the beginning of the century, and I'll or the 20th century. And I'll show you a photograph from there too. And when they went out on a per acre basis, these were the different size trees that they counted for both ponderosa pine and Douglas fir. 1991, when they went back and recollected it, or collected the data again, look at the number of little dug fir that were coming in. Why? What was happening? Climate change, right? No fires. When was the big sleeping child fire? 1903, 1904? In northern Idaho, came into western Montana. So this is after those fires went through. So we know conifer density is increasing, and it's increasing because of this communist plot. It's supposed to be a joke. The United States became incredibly effective with this single campaign to change ecological thought in the United States. We went from accepting fire as part of the ecosystem to fire being terrible something that had to be suppressed. Uh, and, and I think really to our undoing. Here's an example, 1909, in the same area while they were making the survey, this is just north and east of Seeley Lake. If any of you have been up there, it's hard to imagine that scene. But look at the size, these are big western larch, uh, some Doug fir and lodgepole. That great big larch that that fellow is standing by, and I, I can't blow the photographs up very well, but there, there's a fellow sitting on his horse in the background and another horse further back, so you know how big these trees are. They marked that big tree and it became a photo point. So 1938, what do you see happening? Yeah, 1909, Anaconda is just going into this area to begin their logging program uh, to supply mine timbers to Butte. This is, this is a natural forest scape. 1958, same site, there's our big tree. 1979, there's our big tree. Okay, All of these little trees have come in, have filled this area in because fire is bad. So we wind up with this. These overstocked forest stands that I would submit to are low ecological condition. <clears throat> we have forests. Now these trees are competing with each other and so the stress level is going up. Their vulnerability to drought, their vulnerability to insect outbreaks, to other diseases is just skyrocketing. So we've changed the ecological condition in our watershed by simply taking fire out of the picture. This one was really exciting. Uh, I dropped Glenn and uh, uh, Linda, my two students, off, and I said, survey the deadfall in this stand of timber I'm going to drive up the road about half a mile. I'll start another stand and pick you guys up. And I barely got to the second stand we were going to survey and got out of the pickup, and here they were. And I, I said, did you forget something? They said, no, there's a really big grizzly bear back there. <laughs> so I, I felt real bad that I'd kick my students out in the middle of a grizzly, but they were both very wise and took off at a high rate of speed and ran me down. Okay, here's some data to show what happens to our groundwater table uh, when all of these trees start coming in in an unnatural density. 
And this data is all from uh, Whitetail Creek over here the other side of the hill from us. <clears throat> this is groundwater. This is not stream flow. This is groundwater. Over a couple of days, <clears throat> this stand, this RHC36, is dominated by Douglas fir. Look at the tremendous drawdown and recharge of that groundwater in the Douglas fir stand. And then HCA1 or aspen, and that's pretty flat line. So the Doug fir is pulling a lot of water out to create these depressions. Then just to, to go in and we take a smaller block this time and look at the drawdown uh, in the wellhead. This is just the actual elevational drop of the water in the wells in these Douglas fir stands. If you're into statistics, that R square means that just the fact that it's a Douglas fir stand, we can explain 80%, almost 90% of the variation in groundwater just by the tree density. So the take home message is those conifers are really working over the groundwater level. But willows and alders aren't clean. The top bar represents September groundwater fluxes in a willow alder dominated community. But why, why does it flatten out in November? What do you suppose is happening? And Gary can't answer this because he and I tried to get some money to work on this once. They're not using, they're going dormant. Exactly. They dropped all their leaves. And several of us that worked on this together Dr. Waite and, and Steve Chandler and I all went, we should have recorded leaf drop, but we never thought about it. And that's what you see right here. These are a separate, these are all separate groundwater wells up and down that stream. And each of those arrows represents roughly when the groundwater started to recover. And why is it recovering? It's because the aspen, the willows, the alder, Drop their leaves, quit transpiring, but equally as important, it got cold and the Douglas fir in the watershed and the lodgepole quit transpiring as well. Or I shouldn't say quit, it went way, way down. So then the groundwater could recharge and this recharge is all coming from upslope. Okay, this, this was water moving down the drainage into our study area. So I, I did some very poor math to put this together. So average age uh, in there, less than a half a meter, those were all the little, little saplings. They were so stressed that most of those little saplings were 33 years old and they were only that tall because there were so many of them. Then we went to the next height class and they were 53 years old. They weren't doing much better either. And then the great big mama trees, you know, fence post and bigger, 61. So my gallons per day was work done uh, at your sister institution, the University of Montana, where they actually went in and measured transpira transpiration off of these trees. So the little bitty ones, uh, make uh, six gallons, 18 gallons, 26 gallons. Tree density, that's the number of trees per acre in that size class. Well, I had to buy a lot of late evening beverages for my graduate students to get them to count that many trees. But Look, 1991, I showed you, Douglas fir was 1,100. Look what happened by 2007. Look at the number of little stems. Then, if we multiply six times that number, look at the amount of water those trees are pulling out of the ground every day. 
And then I just recalculated this. If I'm going to cut one ton of alfalfa, my colleagues in extension will tell me that's a waste of time and effort to only cut one ton. But just so I could make the math work, it takes about 136,000 gallons of water to raise a ton of alfalfa. Okay, just to give you an idea. This is what those trees are pulling out of the ground per day. It took me about 30 or 40 days to raise that alfalfa. So it, it's hard for me to even get my hand around, even though I've measured this, to drive by a watershed and comprehend the volume of water that's being pulled out of the ground by these trees. So they pump that water out of the ground. There's nothing left to recharge. And so this is the way our streams start looking. Here's the flow clear down here, where it used to be like this. This is a series of springs up by Marysville, up there in the Helena area in the Lewis and Clark. A uh, good example of phreatic groundwater supply. Those ratty, dead-looking things are scholar willow. This was a huge scholar willow community that is no more because of the increased density of conifers in there. The Forest Service has completely lost those big scholar willow communities on the side hill because of the impact of an over-dense conifer stand. Uh, and to show you it works, this is a prescribed burn we did up in Missouri River Breaks where it's dry, dry, dry. Ratty trees. You have to burn them because no self-respecting logger will touch one. <clears throat> These are different drainages. Uh, we burned in 2001 or 2002 uh, in early April. Look at the response in our burn units three and four. Within a year, we had groundwater back within 20 centimeters of the soil surface. We set our prescribed fires to take 70 to 90 percent of those small trees, that dog hair out, and tried to control it so we didn't lose more than 20 percent of our big trees. And actually, we lost 30 percent, but that was still within our margin of error. And look at the response. We did nothing else. In fact, we still had the cattle in there. We never even took the cows out. We just burned the area. So is, this a, is it a function of the, that vegetation intercepting the water before it gets to the water table, or is it the roots down? Whoa, what a, good, what a good question. Yes. <laughs> it, it's both. It's both. Uh, and that's, uh, you can get a big aspen canopy going like in some of your drainages around here uh, and sure clear up till September you can see those quakies drawing that groundwater down every day it pulls it down but winter comes quakies drop their leaves all the snow comes down through the quakey canopy and lands on the ground what's it doing in the juniper and the dug fir and the spruce and the lodgepole it's hanging up in the trees. We lose about 12 to 14 percent of the snowfall to sublimation in those conifer stands. So it, it was both. We reduced the, the draw through transpiration and we increased the amount of snow making it to the ground. But we discovered that there is a threshold. You know, nature never allows us to have an easy lunch, okay, because just as soon as I published that data, I had the Montana Department of Natural Resources from Billings eastward calling me and telling me that I had to get over there to correct my mistake because all the ranchers in the Ashland area were trying to burn all of the private land. So I had to go over and I said, no, 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 look, there's a threshold. If you've got about 270 trees per hectare, don't bother with it. You're okay. You're not in, uh, causing a negative impact. 
But when you get up to 2,000, now we're getting to the point we've got problems. What we found over in Little Whitetail, when we burned that area, we had about 700 to 500 stems per acre, virtually no groundwater response. It hadn't reached its threshold yet. Okay, so I had to go over to Ashland and say, hey, you guys go count your trees. If you're not up in that neck of the woods, don't burn. You're not going to get groundwater response. The other thing that we're slowly learning, this is Deb Canner. She's a really tall woman. I think she's five foot and nothing. And she's, she's doing a survey. This was a Frijole Canyon fire outside of Los Alamos. Uh, it got away and really burned the country up, but it was, a, it was a spruce type that burned probably every 150 to 200 years. When it burned, it tore the country up the next year. The flood events, it's going to take it a long time to recover. But in our inland Douglas fir, ponderosa pine that burn on those shorter intervals, we don't get that big destructive flow, and so they come back quick. So here the riparian areas take, and the processes really unravel, and the system comes apart for a period of time. Here there's a little blip and they just keep going. Two to three year recovery in these inland Douglas fir. What about our smaller evergreens, though? Sagebrush. When I say evergreen, most people don't think about sagebrush, but it's pretty close to being uh, an evergreen. So is it robbing us of water as well? And I realize in the day of sage chickens, this is, uh, I'm, I'm speaking blasphemy to talk about controlling sagebrush. Here's the fire rotation in sagebrush, though. You know, some of these stands, it's as long between fires as it is for some of our high elevation forest types. Except this mountain grasslands type. This is mountain big sagebrush, but mixed with a lot of grass. And look at its fire return interval. And in fact, when we burned over here at Whitetail, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks said, well, we're going to let you do it, but you're going to ruin all of our mule deer and elk winter browse. Two years, three years time, we had beautiful little mountain sagebrush this big. Bob. Did you have to measure cattle recover or, or how did you get your different density? So I'm a sagebrush. Are they similar cattle recover or percentages? Or? Uh, let me go to the next slide. <laughs> okay, this, this one is Ken McAdoo's work. He just went out and found recorder trees. And you can really uh, question this data because the only way he could create this fire return interval was to look at juniper and dug fir and ponderosa pine. And you can make the argument, well, this stuff, it didn't, the forest fire didn't make it out into the sagebrush. And I go, hmm, does that mean Smokey was out there with a shovel putting it out? Because... And, and I think this 35 indicates no, it was burning right along with the Douglas fir. And so here's your question, Bob. We have three watersheds at Red Bluff, or three, five, excuse me. We instrumented them, and then rather than burn them, we sprayed the sagebrush to remove 30% of the canopy cover, okay? Subwatershed A, B, uh, the untreated, and then these two watersheds never responded. Lower elevation, surprise, surprise, less snow, more snow. We treated them in 2013. This is again the water elevation in the wells. Look what happens when we treat and take 30% of the sagebrush cover out. We get increased groundwater. So the sagebrush is having an impact. Now here's our untreated stand, 2015 was really wet. So we actually got increased groundwater in the untreated stand, but significantly less than the treated stands. So they come back in three years. Yeah, 
roughly about three years. And, and, and let me back up because some of my colleagues will not let me in my office tomorrow if I don't say this. I'm going to keep emphasizing this is mountain big sagebrush. If I treat Wyoming or low sagebrush the same way, I've nuked the area. It will be three, four, five hundred years before that sagebrush comes back. So we will have an impact on the elk and the deer and the sage grouse. Mountain big sagebrush, at least around Butte, is Butte tough. You burn it, it comes back. Clayton? Yes, sir. You had several graphs that show the response of the groundwater table, but do you know the porosity or the yield of those wells? So when you're comparing one to the other, it's kind of an important thing. It is, and I don't have somebody smart like you. So no, I, I can't tell you that. All I can tell you is the red bluff, it should be very porous because it's that old Archean granite. It's all sandy loams, gravelly loams. Yes. Uh, the uh, white tail crick was really confused. It depends on where in the crick. We even found Mazama ash over there. So we had the, the grass, the, the broken buried sands and gravels. And then up on the Missouri River breaks, it was just gumbo clay. So I, I, my limited understanding in that, these respond more quickly. The Missouri breaks respond more slowly. Are the aspects different on that? Oh, you bet. Yeah, and this is, this is again, I go out and I lay these out and I go, oh, that was dumb. This is an east-facing aspect, this is a south-facing. Those three are north, so that's why I'm showing those three. North-facing, the, the snow comes off slower. In fact, I could take you out here right now and there's no snow in that coulee this time of year. And this side of this coulee, uh, there's probably a 14-foot deep drift, but this side of the coulee, it's bare and the deer are browsing. These three, it's 14 feet deep because of the wind blow and nothing's in there. So I learned aspect is important. This is some work that was done in this area by Carl Wombolt and some of his graduate students. All I'm trying to point out here is as <clears throat> Douglas fir canopy cover declines, mountain big sagebrush cover increases. Here's the general rule of thumb, Bob, back to your comment. When Douglas fir cover on the site gets up around 20% or higher, the mountain big sagebrush can't compete with it. It declines to less than 15%. By the time you get 35% Douglas fir cover on the site, you have less than 5% mountain big sagebrush. So in the end, I would submit to you the real impact in ecological condition are the big conifers, not the sagebrush. What effect did that have on understory condition <coughs> cover? Uh, here the understory went almost entirely to forbs. Very few grasses with that. This is Clayton Marl's hypothetical model needs to be tested. If any of you have wealthy donors, I would like to talk to them. But based on my work and my observations, the blue line represents the discharge we would find in a stream. The green line represents the conifer canopy cover, Douglas fir, spruce, lodgepole, ponderosa pine. So we initiate fire, the canopy collapses, this is that post or that fire return interval. The canopy comes back. What happens to our stream flow? The stream flow declines. So these streams and rivers in western Montana go through a dynamic equilibrium. Okay? The forest burns off. They get a lot of water coming down the channel. The forest recovers. It depresses the water flow. So this, these are the margins that these systems work through. 
So as conifer density increases in the watershed, we elevate our transpiration losses, plus our canopy interception, surface and groundwater recharge decline, and our riparian footprint, the size of the riparian area, narrows. Now it's easier for cattle, bison, and elk to impact the riparian area. But lower surface flow also means that there's less sediment being delivered to the channel. So what happens to bank recovery and nursery bars? That's why I have the question marks. Those systems have to have a sediment pulse to rebuild banks to create new willows to invite the beaver in. So, the sustainability, the argument I'd like to present to you today, the sustainability of our ecological services means that we have to put our upland natural processes back into play. And that's what this BLM uh, firefighter is doing. He's not putting the fire out, he's causing the fire. Or we're going to have to find reasonable surrogates, selective logging, targeted livestock grazing, to again open these communities up, let them fluctuate. And that really requires, and why I appreciate you folks being here, is it requires a new look at nature. We have to understand that in our lifetime, we may not see a certain plant community a certain ecological characteristic because it isn't time for it yet. We have a hard time getting selective logging in on the Bose, the Gallatin in front because the homeowners on the south side of, Ga of Bozeman don't want to look at an open forest. Okay, well you're not going to have any water in a while. And our ecosystem stability doesn't mean that that landscape doesn't change, okay? It's going to change, and I would submit our job is to learn to live within those changes and to accept those changes. Because our rivers, our fisheries, our ecological services aren't going to be sustainable if we don't accept it. Oops. So thank you folks for listening to me and do you have any questions? You've got to have one question. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. This is a, I, I put this in for that very reason. That's supposed to be the world's longest word. That is a single word in the Maori language. <coughs> And all I can tell you is this is the chieftain's name right here. But after that, there had been a big battle between two opposing clans in this area, and Tamata's brother was killed in the battle. So this is the place name, and this is where Tamata went up on that hillside and played his flute to commemorate his brother's death. So that's all one word. but. I throw it in to make sure you'll ask me at least one question. So, um, going back to the slide, I mean, actually, I can go back and think about the, the landslide slide and the um, addition of the substrate into the water system. Is there a way to fingerprint the substrate that you find in sandbars or along the um, and try to figure out where that? Mm -hmm. uh, really good geologists can look at the mineralogy of the material and am I right with that that, that you can look at the mineralogy uh, radioisotopes uh, some of the old-fashioned guys I worked with actually went so far as to paint rocks and leave them in the channel and then look for them down channel and they could see where they were transported and where they hung up but yes Quentin Skinner working on the Little Snake River was able using radioisotopes to determine that 80 percent of the suspended sediment in the Little Snake was bed and bank erosion it was not being delivered from the uplands now now he's going to correct all of this for me <laughs>
Now, I go back to the, uh, to the climate change, to the global warming. Uh, and one hand, I, I gather from the presentation that fire is good. And uh, it helps uh, the groundwater, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, we have a longer, more days in the year. We have more precipitation as form as water than snow. And that will affect the next cycle, mm -hmm. uh, reducing that snow that we need to recharge our water slowly. So I'm a little bit confused. On one, on one hand, it's helping. On the other side, it's not helping. OK, here's the political answer. We don't know for sure. But, but looking at some of this, I think with climate change and the shift from snow to rainfall, primarily, I think these conifers are still going to pay, play a real significant role, even with the rain. Um, and I'm just not sure how significant it is. But I know some of the people I've worked with in Washington State, and again, it's just amazing what you can get a graduate student to do. Uh, they actually measured the amount of rainfall captured in the canopy of some of those big coastal Douglas fir. Uh, and after a week-long winter front came in and rained, just under five tons of water in the canopy of one of those big trees. Now the question then becomes is, does that evaporate away or does it turn into stem flow and come down the branches and trunks to rehydrate the land at the base of the tree? And that's what we don't know. That's what we're unsure about on that. But for right now, based on that amount of work and some of the early range hydrology work, the canopy interception even of rainfall is significant. Good question. I'm just curious, um, how did you determine your ET, you know, with, of the Douglas fir, like what method did you use? Yeah, you know, I'm going to blame it all on UM. I just took their data. So I'd have to go back and look, look at her oh, okay. disser dissertation. But I, I, she had done it, and I think she actually did it with some of the little parameters. And she climbed up in the tree and clipped them on, and then measured that, and then extrapolated to the size of the canopy. Is that, is that parameter like a sat flow meter or something? Well, this was, uh, this was the granddad to the slat, uh, uh, sat flow meter. It's just a little box with a series of humidity cells in it, that, and it's plexiglass, so it's clear. And she'd just clamp it over uh, a terminal end of some branches with the needles in there. And then she had a temperature gauge in it and then ran it down to her uh, meter box. And she could record as those needles transpired and increased the humidity in there, it decreased the resistance. And she got her measures that way. But yeah, they, they went to sap flow meters after uh, probably about 15 years after that to get a, a more accurate measure. Good question. So what do you think the impact of the big fires that we've had um, you know, just in the last year are going to have? What are we going to see in the rivers? We're going to see a lot of sediment, a lot of phosphorus, a lot of nitrogen, potential uh, eutrophication in some of the backwater areas. And two things, earlier work would say in about two to three years that signal disappears. It's gone. Uh, the system is, the upland system is stabilized and now the stream or river can quickly begin to uh, capture that, begin to sequester it, hold it into place, build new banks. My concern is that back to your comment about loss of snow, and she just made me think of it, is there will be so much sediment delivered to these systems from these fires that if we don't have enough snowfall to create the long duration high flow events, it won't be able to flush that sediment out of the system and we're going to see a graded beds. Now if we get enough rainfall or enough snow that the flows come way up 
and move that sediment out, then my two to three year argument will stand. But we watched on Shanley Creek, which is a tributary of Cottonwood, which is a tributary of the, of the Blackfoot. We watched big slugs of sediment migrate down the stream at about three year intervals. And it almost stayed in the same mass as it moved downstream. And that was because Shanley Creek did not have enough water to flush that material out. So that, that, that's my fear right now, is it's just going to plug all those systems up unless we stay wet. It, it could, and climate change is all of this really good work that was done in the 70s and 80s and 90s with stem flow, change in understory vegetation communities and groundwater. Even my data may go out the window because of, of what happens because of the climate change. But I, one thing I'm, uh, all of a sudden I can't remember his name. A uh, hydrologist at the University of Arizona uh, did a lot of modeling about five or six years ago with climate change and CO2 increased concentration. And his argument was that the woody species were just going to continue to increase in density under that environment, that the herbaceous species would lose out. So we could see even less water. Well, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Thank you for making the effort to come out. Appreciate it.